other local churches. What a blessing it is to have this technology. Help us to use it wisely. Again, with your funds, in your precious holy name we pray. Amen. So I'd like to invite uh, Pastor Martin to uh, provide a children's stories for those kiddos at home, such as mine, uh, that are there. If we can get Pastor Martin uh, the roving mic, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll get this children's story started for you guys. And we apologize we didn't have that for you guys last week, but we have it this week. Good morning, all the boys and girls out there that are watching on some kind of media this morning. <clears throat> my, st <clears throat> my story this morning is, is for, the <clears throat> for the children, but I guess the grown-ups can listen too. So how many of you have tulips coming up in your yard? The sign of spring is not far away. Maybe some other flowers too. I just love the flowers in the spring, especially the tulips that are coming right after the daffodils that are up now. And it's always a reminder that summer is not too far away. So how many of you boys and girls love the summer? I know when I was a young boy, summer was my favorite time of the year. That means I didn't have to go to school and I could explore the forests and the countryside and all kinds of God's creation. So I was fortunate enough that I grew up out in the country in Oregon. And there were a lot of fields around. Well, as the summer went along, you know, I was always inventing new things to have fun. <clears throat> and how many of you have ever made paper airplanes and like to see how far they would fly? I was making paper airplanes, I was flying them, and then I came up with a really great idea. I decided I would light those paper airplanes on fire with a match and see how far those paper airplanes would go before they would turn to ashes and just kind of fall to the ground. Well, it was late summer, and the grass was dry, and guess what? Lo and behold, I caught the field on fire, and one of those paper airplanes landed in the field, and whoosh, the whole field burst into flame. And I was scared. And so I ran back to the farmhouse and I said, Mom, Mom, the field's on fire. Well, I left the part out that I started the fire. The field's on fire and you can see the smoke coming up. We didn't have any close neighbors, but we had some neighbors that were, you know, other kind of many farms around, and they saw the smoke coming up, and they knew what that meant. The fire department was miles away because we were way out in the country. So all the neighbors came with wet blankets and buckets of water, and soon they had the fire out. And my heart was going boom, 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 boom. I was scared to death. And my mother turned to me and she said, do you know how that fire started? And guess what I said? 
No, Mom, I don't know how that fire started. Now, what would we call that? A lie. Now, I knew better. My mother had taught me two things that I had ignored that day. The first one was, don't play with matches. And the second one was, don't lie. I knew I'd tried lying before, and I got my mouth washed out with soap. And it didn't taste very good. I knew that I was going to be in big, big trouble by starting a big, big fire. And so when you're in big, big trouble, what do you do? You tell a big, big lie. No, Mom, I, haven't, I don't know how that fire started. Well, she looked at me, and I don't think she believed me. And I never did have the courage to tell her the truth till years later and I was older and I figured I was too big to spank. <laughs> so I, I knew better not to play with matches and I knew better not to lie. But there was also a saying that I learned I think probably from my mother again, and maybe you've heard this one too, it says, idle hands are the devil's workshop. You ever heard that one? Well, it certainly was true that day. So, boys and girls, where do you think lies came from? Where did they start? Well, Jesus tells us in the Bible that the devil is a, was the father of all lies. In, in the book of John, chapter 8, it says, For he is a liar and the father of lies. So whenever we are tempted to lie, we are coming under the influence of who? The father of lies. The father of lies. Well, it also says in John chapter 8, first it says the truth will set you free. As soon as I told that lie, I had a pain in my heart that kept me awake at night for days and weeks and months because I had lied to my mother. And I knew that she really couldn't trust me. Jesus said, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. For Jesus says again in the book of John in 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So boys and girls, whenever we are tempted to tell a lie, what do we need to do? We immediately need to go to Jesus and ask, what would Jesus do in this situation? And the decision we make will decide whether we're on Jesus' side or on the devil's side. For the devil is the father of lies, and Jesus is the way, and the truth, and the life. So boys and girls, I pray whenever you are tempted to tell a lie, just remember, 
who the Father of lies is. And remember to always pray to Jesus to tell the truth. Thank you for coming. God bless. Thank you, Pastor Martin, for this story. I love it. And it goes quite well, I believe, uh, with today's message. You may have heard the story of two friends who met for dinner in a restaurant. Each requested a veggie filet of sole. And after a few minutes, the waiter came back with their order. Two pieces of fish, a large and a small were on the same platter. One of the men proceeded to serve his friend, placing the small piece on the platter. He handed it across the table. Well, you certainly have the nerve, ex exclaimed his friend. What's troubling you? asked the other. Look what you've done, he answered. You've given me the little piece and kept the big one for yourself. How would you have done it? Asked the man. His friend replied, If I were serving, I would have given you the big piece. <coughs> well, replied the man that served first, I've got it, haven't I? At this, they both laughed. The things that will destroy America are peace at any price, prosperity at any cost, safety first instead of duty first, the love of soft living, and the get-rich-quick theory of life. Most have attributed that to Theodore Roosevelt. Could our selfish requests or actions be deadlier than the coronavirus? Turn with me to Matthew 20. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning humbly asking you for the Holy Spirit to not only speak through this pastor, but also through the many members that are at home or that will maybe watch this sermon at any other given time, that you give us the Holy Spirit to get the discernment that we need in order to understand how amazing your words are and for the life lessons that we have uh, to receive and to change so that we can do one thing, Lord. Bless this world with your good news. We ask now for the Holy Spirit in a mighty way. In dear Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to start with... The audacity of ambition is lethal. We're going to be in chapter 20, and we're reading from verse 20 to 23. Then the mother of Zebedee, sons, came to him with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, What do you wish? She said to him, Grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left of your, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, You do not know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I'm, a, that I'm baptized with? They said to him, We are able. So he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those whom it is prepared by my Father. Jesus, heading towards the cross, he has set his face towards Jerusalem, he is surely thinking deep thoughts about the dramatic showdown he will face in the holy city just a few days from now. 
This passage is just one paragraph away from Holy Week, just five verses prior to that fearful day. He has told his disciple what lies ahead, but they don't get it. They just can't see it. They are still thinking about powerful, luxurious military kingdom. So here they come, James and John, and their mother, with, their, with this ambitious, presumptuous request. The mother makes the request, but don't miss this now. James and John are right there with her. They are in, they are all in this together. What does she want? The top two spots in this new kingdom that Jesus is about to establish. The top two spots for her sons, James and John. Jesus answers, you don't know what you're asking. You see, Jesus knew that they weren't seeing it clearly. They were thinking about power and position and fame and political clout while he was thinking about sacrificial love and suffering and service. They were thinking about rising to the places of prestige. He was thinking about death on a cross. They were thinking about the perks of being rulers in high places. He was thinking about serving the world by being a suffering servant. So Jesus says to them, in fact, you are talking the talk, but the real question is, can you walk the walk? This is where the famous hymn, Are You Able?, said the Master, comes from. James and John answer boldly, Lord, we are able. End of story. And they all live happily ever after, right? Not quite. Let's find out what the Bible says about this. Verse 24. And when the ten heard it, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And those who are great exercise authority over them. Aha! The other disciples get wind of this. Of how James and John are trying to slip in ahead of them and they don't like it. The scripture says that they began to be in indignant, angry with James and John. So Jesus calls them all together and gives them the lesson one more time. And he says, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. In my kingdom, true greatness is not found in fortune or fame, not found in position or power or political clout. Those things are fragile and fleeting. No, true gratefulness is found in being a servant. That's a hard lesson to learn, isn't it? <laughs> it continues to be a hard lesson till this day. Ambition, if you could translate the word desire, ambition, just to kind of modernize it for us and give us some context. Ambition in and of itself is a good thing, a natural, normal part of our makeup. We all want to be important. We all want to be significant. We all want to do our best. So ambition is basically a good quality. It only becomes bad when it's distorted or misused. When it becomes selfish or ruthless or cruel, then it becomes monstrous, destructive, as a tyrant. That's what was brewing in the disciples that day. James and John, with the help of their mother, were saying, we're going to get ahead no matter what. We have 
to do is step or push aside. And you know, maybe they didn't do that, right? So we're posing. Because that's the world we live in, isn't it? People do elbow you out of a position. People do give perhaps half-truths to the boss when they're saying what their team did. I've been there before. Praise God, I've never been the one to give the elbow. But I knew distinctively that by giving a 100% account, I've felt like in my past, it's perhaps either held me back or kept me at the same position. It was a choice I had to make. I knew somebody was watching, right? Right? I knew after I've given my life to Jesus, records are there, right? Even if you don't give your life to Jesus, according to Revelation, we see that the records are there. The books will be opened. There is no secret, right? But I knew better how I acted. It wasn't easy, though. Temptation there. Make myself bigger than what I really was. So, there it is, the picture of ruthless, selfish ambition. And it is not a very pretty picture, isn't it? Consider this quote. If you, from too high, if you form a too high opinion of yourself, you will think that your labors are of more real consequence than they are. And you will plead individual independence which borders on arrogance. If you go to the other extreme and form too low of an opinion of yourself, you will feel inferior and you will leave an impression of inferiority, which will greatly limit the influence that you might have for good. You should avoid either extreme. Feeling should not control you circumstances should not affect you. You may form a correct estimate of yourself, one which will prove a safeguard from both extremes. You may be dignified without vain self-confidence. You may be um, condensating and yielding without sacrificing self-respect or individual independence, and your life may be of great influence with those in the higher as well as those that walk in the lower parts of this life. Something to consider, right? But then Jesus straightens them out. He says, it's okay to be ambitious, right? To desire. We'll read that in a second. But don't be ambitious to promote yourself, is what he's trying to say. Rather, be ambitious to help others. Be ambitious to serve other people. Selfish ambition is blind and fraught with problems and difficulties. Now let's break this down a bit and bring it closer to home with three thoughts. First thought, ambition can make you arrogant. We've already given that clue. See what Luke says in chapter 18, verses 10 through 14. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people. Hmm. Oh boy. Robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all that I get. <clears throat> but the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, 
went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled. And those who humble themselves will be exalted. Good news, isn't it? For those of us that believe our work goes unnoticed, for those of us that have been pleading with family members to give their life to Jesus, yet it just seems like it falls on deaf ears, Your work does not go unnoticed by our Heavenly Father. Amen? Don't be discouraged. Recently, I, uh, I enjoyed reading this contemporary takeoff of this parable. This is how it goes. Two men went to church to pray. One, a man named Hornblower. The other was a teacher. The man named Hornblower stood and looked heavily, saying, God, I thank you that I am so much better than the other people. I thank you, Lord, O oh Lord, that I am not like the rest of humankind. And especially, I thank you that I am not like this poor teacher here who feeds off of the public payroll. Obviously not talking about some of the Christian academy, whom we have... To we get the privilege of supporting, but it's hard, isn't it, Pam? Not easy. Not easy. Praise the Lord for people that support Adventist education. It's my money that pays this teacher's salary. It's my money that keeps his school and this community going. I bet our Adventist teachers probably have felt this way that when people look at them. So I thank you, Lord, that I am the great man that I am, and that like this poor, pitiful schoolman here, not like, excuse me, this poor, pitiful schoolman here, hearing this, the school teacher humbly bowed his head and said, Oh, Lord, have mercy, for I was that man's teacher. I like that story. When James and John came that day, hiding behind their mother's skirt and making this arrogant request, thinking that greatness was tied to earthly position, don't you imagine that Jesus felt like saying, Mercy me, haven't they been listening to me? Haven't they heard all all my lessons about humility and service and sacrificial love. Did they not hear me when I talked about kindness through thoughtfulness and generosity towards others? Don't they understand by now that being a big person does not come from holding some big position, but from having a big heart. Don't they get it? Don't they see that true greatness does not come from serving yourself, but from serving God and serving others? The world may assess a person's greatness by the number of people they control and who are at their beck and call, or by their intellectual standing or their academic eminence, or by the number of committees of which they are a member, or by the size of their bank balance and the material possessions which they have amassed. But in the assessment of Jesus Christ, these things are irrelevant. Christ's assessment of grateful, greatness is quite simply, how many people has that person helped? That's it. There's a, there's a poem that I appreciated. While not a poet myself, do appreciate a poem. So here, here it goes. Here it goes. 
You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say, I. You cannot pray the Lord's Prayer and even once say, My. Nor can you pray the Lord's Prayer and not pray for another. For when you pray for daily bread, you must include your sister and your brother. For others are included in each and every plea. From the beginning to the end of it, it does not once say, me. Notice here in Matthew 20 that Jesus does not abolish or condemn the desire to serve. The ambition, if you will, to match the play on words. He, re he redeems it. He says, be ambitious, but be, but be ambitious for others. Be ambitious to be a servant. Desire, right? The text says desire. We're just replacing that with ambition. Just, just to work with the play on words here. So, that's number one. Blind, selfish ambition makes you arrogant. Second, blind, selfish, excuse me, second, am, ambitious uh, blind selfish ambition makes you adverse, uh, adverse surreal. That is, it causes you to see everyone else as the adversary, as the enemy, as the competitor. Up to this point, Peter, James, and John had been very close friends, partners, buddies, and colleagues. They were the inner circle, Jesus' closest, confidants, his executive committee. But now as they approach Jerusalem and what they thought would be their establishment of a powerful and prosperous now in the crucial moment when thought prize appointments would soon be handed out, now in a crunch time, suddenly James and John saw Simon and Peter differently. Blinded by their selfish ambition, they now saw Simon Peter as the adversary, the enemy, the rest of them, right? And they snuck in. Put their elbows out and got in the first request. Seems like that's what Mark's uh, gospel records it. In Mark, James and John come to Jesus with their request for the most prestigious position. Matthew you could imagine, was so embarrassed by that blind ambition of James and John that later when he tells the story, meaning Matthew in, in this chapter, he softens it. Do you remember how? By having the mother of James and John make the request. You see, in the Gospel of Mark, we don't see that. That detail is not there. But you know what? you can't really cover that type of sin, can you? James and John were great men, great disciples to whom we owe much. But in that moment, the ambition blinded them. Third point and final point, blind, selfish ambition makes you apathetic towards other people. There's an old story about a young man from West Virginia. Of course, I had to go with the story because I've lived in West Virginia. Who went off to college at a prestigious Eastern University. The mountain youngster was able to go to this highly regarded Ivy League school only because his father was so proud of his academic record. And his dad had worked many, many hours of overtime in the lumber mill in his hometown to pay for his college. There was tuition and books and room and board, and the young man told his dad that you weren't anybody unless you pledged the most elite, to, to the most elite fraternity on campus, and they wanted him. And so he really needed more money, lots more money. And of course, he would have 
to have a new wardrobe. His dad, who had never set a foot onto a college campus, was so excited to hear about his son's college exploits. And he said to his son, no problem. Go for it. He would come up with the money, and so he did. So it all worked out fine. The young man was so caught up with his new friends that he just couldn't make it home for Thanksgiving or Christmas. But of course, he would need some more money. And then spring break came. We've all seen the responsibilities this week on spring break, haven't we, with this whole coronavirus? I don't know. I'm not going not gonna to blame those people. I was there once. Not good. Selfishness. You feed selfishness there. He called his dad and said it was the most important for him to go to the beach. Everybody was going, and he would need some more money. So please, send money quickly, Dad. But while he was on the beach in Florida, he got an urgent message that his dad had had a serious heart attack. But it was too late. His dad was gone. A few of his dad's lifelong friends from the lumber mill were gathered in the hospital waiting room. When the young man walked in, Wilbur, his dad's best friend, hugged him. And as he and the other friends left the room later, Wilbur handed the young man a pile of neatly folded clothes and a pair of shoes. His dad's work overalls and his dad's work boots. As the young man sat there in the waiting room holding his father's clothes, he noticed the boots. The boots each had a huge hole in the bottom. His father worked each day in boots with holes in them. His dad, who always seemed to be seemed able to come up with the money for his kid's khaki slacks and crisp Oxford shirts and penny loafers, that man's feet burned from the heat of the lumber mill floor while he labored for his hourly wages to provide for his son who took it all for granted. And the pain was too much. The boy cried out at the magnitude of his father's sacrificial love. And he cried in shame at his own apathy and preoccupation and selfishness and his lack of appreciation. It would be a long time before he could think of his father without weeping. I have a feeling that that's the way James and John must have felt a few days after their presumptuous request. When they saw the nail prints in Jesus' hands, the hole in his side, the symbols of his sacrificial love, I could just see them weeping and saying, what were we thinking? How foolish we were. How blind. The point is clear. Selfish ambition can blind, blind the best of us. You know, we often say, they were right there with Jesus. We have an excuse, don't we? We can't see him. We can't touch him can't hold them. We can't fall at his feet. Useless excuse we have. We have vision 2020, don't we? Or we have the hindsight 2020. They didn't. 
Now, James and John eventually saw the light. Amen? The question here today is, have we seen the light? Verse 26 says, Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's an old story that we just mentioned that, that just, it, it moves me. How can we be so negligent with our Heavenly Father? I like the story of this young man because it just kind of hits home how much we take things for granted. And we often don't take people for granted that are separated from us in social, um, that are not in our social influence, right? We often hurt the ones nearest to us. Doesn't sound like it would even make sense in a sinful world, does it? Remember, have you heard, hey, stop biting the hand that feeds you, right? Or you shouldn't bite the hand that feeds you. We have sayings like this because we live in a world that that's what we do. Yet, we bite the hand of the bread of life who is trying to give us peace and joy amidst a crazy world we live in. Have we changed like James and John? Indeed we can, though, and that's the good news for today. Just like they did, if you're struggling, if you need this change, and I believe at some level, all of us do, we fight with self every day once we know Jesus. It's then when we clearly see how self gets in the way, isn't it? When we have the Holy Spirit tugging at our hearts, I believe that's when we start this painful, painful journey of realizing how much we've hurt others, especially the ones closest to us. So our biblical answer is tough, but it's true. So Jesus, I repeat what he says. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be a servant. Whoever wants to be first among you must be a slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. So, I, I mentioned that if you stuck to the end of the sermon, you would see something special. So at this time, I'd like to invite Josh up here. And many of you know Josh. And I'd like to ask Josh a couple of questions. Josh, is it your desire to follow Jesus, to become his servant wherever you go? To its fullest. Amen. Okay. Were you able to hear that, I think? Okay. He said to his fullest. We'll, we'll, we'll keep it quick. Yeah, on this side will be better. Okay. We'll wait for Henry to turn that mic on. So I'll, I'll repeat the question. Is it your desire to follow Jesus and to become his servant and wherever you go and to accept him as your personal Lord and Savior? Yes, sir, to its fullest. Are you excited to rely on the Holy Spirit daily as a compass to guide your life from this day forward? Yes, without fear. Amen. What a celebration. It's just too bad that the party isn't here. The party is at home today. Awesome. What a, what a blessing. Josh has uh, given me um, the great pleasure 
to uh, understand uh, a couple of weeks back, well, maybe three weeks back, right? Uh, his desire to uh, give his life to Jesus. And um, you made my day. And knowing that this day was coming, my day has been being made. So at this time, we're going to ask for a special song, and we're going to go to the back and get ready. Okay? And um, I'd like to introduce uh, Sarah Lynn for a uh, special song at this time.
Okay. What an exciting moment right now for Josh and I and Jesus and all of his family, all of his loved ones, his friends that may see this not only today, but in the upcoming days for his kids to see his wife, to see what a blessing uh, this moment really is. I can't imagine a, a day more special than today where you get to get a guarantee from God's word that you have a new life. It doesn't matter what we've done in the past. It doesn't matter where we've been. For me and for this young man that went to spring break, it doesn't matter. It's over. A new birth is here. And Josh, when he gave me this news, like I said before, I was thrilled. Thrilled that the kingdom gains one more child, right? We're all children, children of God. And um, I asked Josh uh, if he had something to say. Sometimes people want to just say something, but do you have anything small to say? Any, any? I know you didn't prepare a dissertation. Well, I, I feel like I could fall asleep now and not be afraid of anything. It doesn't matter if, uh, if I fall asleep and I don't wake up. If I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die on my own terms, and I'm gonna die now. And I'm gonna live each day for Christ. And as you die, in a couple of moments, you have new life with Jesus. Amen? What a powerful day. Heaven is rejoicing. Often we don't, we don't get the, drum, the drums out here on this earth. I don't know why. This is such a huge moment. And those of you at home, cheer as Josh comes out. A new man. Spiritually, he's, he's born today. What a powerful way to live, isn't it? Amen. Okay. So before we, um, before we, we go here, I'd like to uh, invite the family, if they want to come up a little bit. Um, we, we let them out of quarantine, didn't we, today? Yeah, yeah. Specifically for today? We'll ask for forgiveness later. But if, if they want to come here and, and maybe even the kids watch, watch Dad uh, get get baptized. This is all unedited, right? Unscript. That's right. So if uh, sometimes children have the biggest curiosity of just seeing it and being part of this. And for those of you also, not only here but at home, that want to follow Josh's lead here and give your life to Jesus in a more powerful way, we invite you to consider this. Consider the example that Josh is, is not only displaying for his own family and the testimony that he's sharing with them, but he's going to be sharing this at work. He's going to be on fire for Jesus. He's going to be discovering gifts that he never thought he had. And we all know that Josh has gifts. We can't wait for you to play the guitar again, but, right? Yeah, and sing. Be a lot of fun. Can't and wait for everybody to come back. Right? I know. <laughs> We need to pray for that. Oh, man, the social gathering thing is, is not cool. But anyway, we, we are so thankful that we're here today. So it is my honor and privilege to baptize you, Josh, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Like I said, if any one of you, any one of you desires to live this moment as Josh has lived, he has new life. Praise God for that. Talk to us. Bring it up to your local pastor. If you're at home, if you're far away, you're in the East Coast, wherever you are, speak to your pastor. You're being baptized into the body of Christ, not to this local church, not to that church, into the great body of Christ. Amen. Amen. We we're so thankful that you were with us here today to witness this amazing, amazing moment. As Pam plays the last song, think about that invitation that Jesus is making to you today.
we hope that you choose life. Just as Josh, Josh has been uh, reborn today and chose life. God bless you all. Thank you.